Chapter 7 of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do, Chapter 7 The image of the knife on the glowing screen was clear and finely detailed. It was, Stanton thought, as though one were looking through a window into the knife's nest itself. Only the tremendous depth of focus of the lens that had caught the picture gave the illusion a feeling of unreality. Everything, background and foreground alike, was sharply in focus. Like some horrendous dream monster, the knipe moved in slow motion, giving Stanton the eerie feeling that the alien was moving through a thicker, heavier medium than air, in a place where the gravity was much less than that of Earth. With ponderous deliberation the fingers of one of his hands closed upon the handle of an oddly shaped tool, and lifted it slowly from the surface upon which he worked. "'That's our best-placed camera,' said Colonel Mannheim. "'But some of the others can always get details that this one doesn't. The trouble is that we'll never really have enough cameras in there, not unless we stud the walls, ceilings, and floors with them, and even then I'm not so sure we'd get everything.' It isn't the same as having a trained expert on camera who is trying to demonstrate what he's doing. An expert plays to the camera and never obstructs any of his own movements. But the knipe He left the sentence unfinished and shook his head sadly. Stanton narrowed his eyes at the image. To his own speeded-up perceptive processes the motion seemed intolerably slow. Would you mind speeding it up a little?" he asked the colonel. I want to get an idea of the way he moves, and I can't really get the feeling of it at this speed. Certainly. The colonel turned to the technician at the controls. Speed the tape up to normal. If there's anything Mr. Stanton wants to look at more closely, we can run it through again. As if in obedience to the colonel's command, the knipe seemed to shake himself a little and go about his business more briskly and the air and gravity seemed to revert to those of Earth. "'What's he doing?' Stanton asked. The knipe was performing some sort of operation on an odd-looking box that sat on the floor in front of him. The colonel pointed. "'He's got a screwdriver that he's modified to give it a head with an L-shaped cross-section, and he's wiggling it around inside that hole in the box but what he's doing is a secret between God and the knipe at this point," Colonel Mannheim said glumly. Stanton glanced away from the screen for a moment to look at the other men who were there. Some of them were watching the screen, but most of them seemed to be watching Stanton, although they looked away as soon as they saw his eyes on them. All, that is, except Dr. George Yoritomo, who simply gave him a smile of confidence. Trying to see what kind of a bloke this touted Superman is, Stanton thought. Well, I can't say I blame him. He brought his attention back to the screen. So this was the Knipe's hideaway. He wondered if it were furnished in the fashion that a Knipe's living quarters would be furnished on whatever planet the multi-legged horror had come from. Probably it had the same similarity as Robinson Crusoe's island home had to a middle-class nineteenth-century English home. There was no furniture in it at all, as such. Low-slung as he was, the knipe needed no tables or workbenches. All his work was spread out on the floor, with a neatness and tidiness that would have surprised many human technicians. For the same reason he needed no chairs and since true sleep was a form of metabolic rest he evidently found unnecessary, he needed no bed. The closest thing he did that might be called sleep was his habit of stopping whatever he was doing and remaining quiet for periods of time that ranged from a few minutes to a couple of hours. Sometimes his eyes remained opened during these periods, sometimes they were closed. It was difficult to tell whether he was sleeping or just thinking. The difficulty was in getting cameras in there in the first place, Colonel Mannheim was saying. That's why we missed so much of his early work. There, look at that. His finger jabbed at the image. 
The attachment he's making? That's right. Now it looks as though it's a meter of some kind. But we don't know whether it's a test instrument or an integral and necessary part of the machine he's making. The whole machine might even be only a test instrument for something else he's building. Or perhaps a machine to make parts for some other machine. After all, he had to start out from the very beginning. Making the tools to make the tools to make the tools, you know." Dr. Yoritomo spoke for the first time. "'It's not quite as bad as all that, eh, Colonel? We must remember that he had our technology to draw upon. If he'd been wrecked on Earth two or three centuries ago, he wouldn't have been able to do a thing.' Colonel Mannheim smiled at the tall, lean man. Granted, he said agreeably, but it's quite obvious that there are parts of our technology that are just as alien to him as parts of his are to us. Remember how he went to all the trouble of building a pentote vacuum tube for a job that could have been done by transistors he already had had a chance to get and didn't? His knowledge of solid-state physics seems to be about a century and a half behind ours. Stanton listened. Dr. Yorotomo was, in effect, one of his training instructors. Advanced alien psychology, Stanton thought. Seminar course. The mental whys and wherefores of the Nipe, or how to outthink the enemy in twelve dozen easy lessons. Instructor, Dr. George Yorotomo. The smile on Yorotomo's face was beatific, but he held up a warning finger. Ah, uh, ah, uh, Colonel! We mustn't fall into a trap like that so easily. Remember that gimmick he built last year? The one that blinded those people in Baghdad? It had five perfect emeralds in it, connected in series with silver wire, eh?" That's true, the colonel admitted, but they weren't used the way we'd use semiconducting materials. Indeed not. But the thing worked, didn't it? He has a knowledge of solid-state physics that we don't have, and vice versa." "'Which one would you say was ahead of the other?' Stanton asked. "'I don't mean just in solid-state physics, but in science as a whole.' "'That's a difficult question to answer,' Dr. Yorotomo said thoughtfully. "'Frankly, I'd put my money on his technology as encompassing more than ours at least insofar as the physical sciences are concerned." "'I agree,' said Colonel Mannheim. "'He's got things in that little nest of his that—' He stopped and shook his head slowly, as though he couldn't find words. "'I will say this,' Yoritomo continued. "'Whatever his great technological abilities, our friend the Nipe has plenty of good, solid guts. And patience.' He smiled a little and then amended his statement. From our own point of view. Stanton looked at him quizzically. How do you mean? I was just about to agree with you until you tacked that last phrase on. What does point of view have to do with it? Everything, I should say, said Yoritomo. It all depends on the equipment an individual has. A man, for instance, who rushes into a building to save a life, wearing nothing but street clothes, has courage. A man who does the same thing when he's wearing a nullotherm suit is an unknown quantity. There is no way of knowing, from that action alone, whether he has courage or not." Stanton thought he saw what the scientist was driving at. "'But you're not talking about technological equipment now,' he said. "'Not at all. I'm talking about personal equipment. He turned his head slightly to look at the colonel. "'Colonel Mannheim, do you think it would require any personal courage on Mr. Stanton's part to stand up against you in a face-to-face -face gunfight?' The colonel grinned tightly. "'I see what you mean.' Stanton grinned back rather wryly. "'So do I. No, it wouldn't.' "'On the other hand,' Yoritomo continued, "'if you were to challenge Mr. Stanton, would that show courage on your part, Colonel?" Not really. Foolhardiness, stupidity, or insanity, but not courage. Ah, then, said Yoritomo with a beaming smile, neither of you can prove you have guts enough to fight the other, can you? 
Mannheim smiled grimly and said nothing. But Stanton was thinking the whole thing out very carefully. "'Just a second, he said. That depends on the circumstances. If Colonel Mannheim, say, knew that forcing me to shoot him would save the life of someone more important than himself, or perhaps the lives of a great many people, what then? Yoritomo bowed his head in a quick nod. Exactly. That is what I meant by viewpoint. Whether the knife has courage or patience, or any other human feeling, depends on two things. His own abilities, and exactly how much information he has. A man can perform any action without fear if he knows that it will not hurt him, or if he does not know that it will." Stanton thought that over in silence. The image of the knife was no longer moving. He had settled down into his sleeping position, unmoving, although the baleful violet eyes were still open. "'Cut that off,' Colonel Mannheim said to the operator. There's not much to learn from the rest of that tape." As the image blanked out, Stanton said, "'Have you actually managed to build any of the devices he's constructed, Colonel?' "'Some,' said Colonel Mannheim. "'We have specialists all over the world studying those tapes. We have the advantage of being able to watch every step the knight makes, and we know the materials he's been using to work with. But, even so, the scientists are baffled by many of them. Can you imagine the time James Clark Maxwell would have had trying to build a modern television set from tapes like this?" "'I can imagine,' Stanton said. "'You can see, then, why we're depending on you,' Mannheim said. Stanton merely nodded. The knowledge that he was actually a focal point in human history that the whole future of the human race depended to a tremendous extent on him, was a realization that weighed heavily, and, at the same time, was immensely bracing. "'And now,' the Colonel said, "'I'll turn you over to Dr. Yoritomo. He'll be able to give you a great deal more information than I can.'" End of Chapter 7 Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do. Chapter 8 The girl moved with the peculiar gliding walk so characteristic of a person walking under low gravity conditions, and the ease and grace with which she did it showed that she was no stranger to low G. To the three men from Earth who followed her a few paces behind, the G-pole seemed so low as to be almost non-existent, although it was actually shade over one-quarter of that of Earth, the highest gravitational pole of any planetoid in the belt. Their faint feeling of nausea was due simply to their lack of experience with really low gravity. The largest planetoid in the belt had a surface gravity that was only one-eighth the pole they were now experiencing and only one-thirty-second of the earth gravity they were used to. The planetoid they were on, or rather in, was known throughout the belt simply as Threadneedle Street, and was nowhere near as large as Ceres. What accounted for the relatively high gravity pull of this tiny body was its spin. Moving in its orbit, out beyond the orbit of Mars, it turned fairly rapidly on its axis, rapidly enough to overcome the feeble gravitational field of its mass. It was a solid, roughly spherical mass of nickel-iron, nearly two-thirds of a mile in diameter, and, like the other inhabited planetoids of the belt, honeycombed with corridors and rooms cut out of the living metal itself. But the corridors and rooms were oriented differently from those of other planetoids. Threadneedle Street made one complete rotation about its axis in something less than a minute and a half, and the resulting centrifugal force reversed the normal up and down so that the center of the planetoid was overhead to anyone walking inside it. It was that fact which added to the queasiness of the three men from Earth who were following the girl down the corridor. They knew that only a few floors beneath them yawned the mighty nothingness of infinite space. The girl, totally unconcerned with thoughts of that vast emptiness, stopped before a door that led off the corridor and opened it. Mr. Martin, she said, 
These are the gentlemen who have an appointment with you, Mr. Gerald, Mr. Vanden Bosch, Mr. Nguma." She called off each name as the man bearing it walked awkwardly through the door. Gentlemen, she finished, this is Mr. Stanley Martin. Then she left, discreetly closing the door. The young man behind the desk in the metal-walled office stood up smiling as the three men entered, offered his hand to each, and shook hands warmly. "'Sit down, gentlemen,' he said, gesturing toward three solidly built chairs that had been anchored magnetically to the nickel-iron floor of the room. "'Well,' he said genially, when the three had seated themselves, "'how was the trip out?' He watched them closely, without appearing to do so, as they made their polite responses to his question. He was acquainted with them only through correspondence. Now was his first chance to evaluate them in person. Barnabas Nguma, a very tall man whose dark brown skin and eyes made a sharp contrast with the white of the mass of tiny crisp curls on his head, smiled when he spoke, but there were lines of worry etched around his eyes. Pleasant enough, Mr. Martin. I'm afraid that steady 1G acceleration has left me unprepared for this low gravity." Well said Stefan Vandenbusch. It really wasn't so bad once you get used to it. As long as it's steady I don't mind it." He was a rather chubby man of average height, with blond hair that was beginning to gray at the temples and pale blue eyes that gave his face an expression of almost childlike innocence. Arthur Gerall, the third man, was almost as light-complexioned as Vandenbusch. His thinning hair was light brown, and his eyes were a deep gray-blue, and the lines in his hard, blocky face gave him a look of grim determination. "'I agree, Stefan. It isn't the low gravity per se. It's the doggone surges. We went from one G to zero when the ship came in for a landing at the pole of Threadneedle Street. Then as we came back down here, the gravity kept going up, and that—what do you call it—Coriolis force?' Yeah, that's it. It made my head feel as though the whole room was spinning." Then realizing what he'd said, he laughed sharply. The man behind the desk laughed with him. Yes, it is a bit disconcerting at first, but the spin gives enough g-pull to make a man feel comfortable once he's used to it. That's one of the reasons why Threadneedle Street was picked. As the financial center of the belt, we have a great many visitors from Earth and one quarter G is a lot easier to get used to than a fiftieth." Then he looked quickly at the others and said, "'Now, gentlemen, how can Lloyds of London help you?' He had phrased it that way on purpose, deliberately making it awkward for them to bring up the subject they had on their minds. It was Nguma who broke the short silence. "'Quite simply, Mr. Martin, we have come to put our case before you in person. It is not Lloyd's we want, it is you." "'You refer to our correspondence on the Nipe case, Mr. Nguma?' "'Exactly. We feel—' The man behind the desk interrupted him. "'Mr. Nguma, do you have any further information?' He looked as though such news would be welcome, but that it would not change his mind in the least. "'That's just it, Mr. Martin,' said Nguma. We don't know whether our little bits and dribbles of information are worth anything." The man behind the desk leaned back in his chair again. "'I see,' he said softly. "'Well, just what is it you want of me, Mr. Nguma?' Nguma looked surprised. "'Why, just what I've written, sir. You are acknowledged as the greatest detective in the solar system, bar none. We need you, Mr. Martin. Earth needs you that inhuman monster has been killing and robbing for ten years. Men, women, and children have been slaughtered and eaten as though they were cattle. You've got to help us find that god-awful thing." Before there could be any answer, Arthur Gerald leaned forward earnestly and said, "'Mr. Martin, we don't just represent businessmen who have been robbed. We also represent hundreds and hundreds of people who have had friends and relatives murdered by that horror. Little people, Mr. Martin. Ordinary people who are helpless against the terror of a superhuman evil. This isn't just a matter of money and goods lost. It's a matter of lives lost. Human lives, Mr. Martin. 
They're not the only ones who are concerned, either," Vandenbush broke in. If that hellish thing isn't destroyed, more will die. Who knows how long a beast like that may live? What is its lifespan? Nobody knows." He waved a hand in the air. For all we know, it could go on for another century, maybe more, killing, killing, killing. The detective looked at them for a moment in silence. These three men represented more than just a group of businessmen who had grown uneasy about the government's ability to catch the knife. They represented more than a few hundred or even a few thousand people who had been directly affected by the monster's depredations. They represented the growing feeling of unrest that was making itself known all over Earth. It was even making itself felt out here in the belt, although the Nipe had not, in the past decade, shown any desire to leave Earth. Why hadn't the beast been found? Why couldn't it be killed? Why were its raids always so fantastically successful? For every tooth-mark that inhuman thing had left on a human bone, it had left a thousand unhuman minds, marks of a fear that was more than a fear. It was a deep-seated terror of the unknown. The number of people killed in ordinary accidents in a single week was greater than the total number killed by the Nipe in the last decade, but nowhere were men banding together to put a stop to that sort of death. Accidental death was a known factor, almost a friend. The Nipe was stark horror. The detective said, "'Gentlemen, I'm sorry, but what I said in my last letter still goes. I can't take the job. I will not go to Earth.' Every one of the three men could sense the determination in his voice, the utter finality of his words. There was no mistaking the iron-hard will of the man. They knew that nothing could shake him nothing, at least, that they could do. But they couldn't admit defeat. No matter how futile they knew it to be, they still had to try. Nguma took a billfold from his jacket-pocket, opened it, and took out an engraved sheet of paper with an embossed seal in one corner. He put it on the desk in front of the detective. "'Would you look at that, Mr. Martin?' he asked. The detective picked it up and looked at it. The expression on his face did not change. Two hundred and fifty thousand, he said in a voice that showed only polite interest. A cool quarter of a million. That's a lot of money, Mr. Nguma. It is, said Nguma. As you can see, that sum has just been deposited here, in the belt branch of the Bank of England. It will be transferred to your account immediately, as soon as you agree to come to Earth and find and kill the Nipe." The detective looked up from his inspection of the certificate. He had known that the three men had made a visit to the bank's offices, and he had been fairly sure of their purpose when he had received the information. He had not known the sum would be quite so large. "'A quarter of a million just to take the job?' he asked. And what if I don't catch him?" "'We have faith in you, Mr. Martin,' Nguma said. "'We know your reputation. We know what you've done in the past. The government police haven't been able to do anything. They're completely baffled, and have been for ten years. They will continue to be so. This alien's mind is too devilishly sharp for the kind of men in government service. We know that when you take this job, the finest brain in the solar system will be searching for that horror. If you can't find him—' He spread his hands in a gesture that was partly a dismissal of all hope, and partly an appeal to the man whose services he wanted so desperately. The detective put the certificate down on the desktop and pushed it toward Nguma. "'That's very flattering, sir, really. And I wish there were some more diplomatic way of saying no, but that's all I can say.' There will be a like sum deposited to your account as soon as you either kill or capture the Nipe, or, discovering his hideout, enable the government officials to kill or capture him," said Nguma. "'That's half a million in all,' Gerald put in. "'We've worked hard to raise that money, Mr. Martin. It should be enough.' The detective kept his temper under icy control, allowing just enough of his anger to show to make his point.
Mr. Gerrell, it is not a question of money. Your offer is more than generous." "'It's our final offer,' Gerald said flatly. "'I hope it is, Mr. Gerald," the detective said coldly. "'I sincerely hope it is. For the past six months you and your organization have been trying to get me to take this job. I appreciate the sincerity of your efforts, believe me. And, as I said, I am honored and flattered that you should think so highly of me. On the other hand, your method of going about it is hardly flattering. I turned down your first offer of twenty thousand six months ago. Since then you have been going up and up and up until you have finally reached twenty-five times the original amount. You seem to think I have been holding out for more money. I have attempted to disabuse you of that notion, but you would not read what I put down in my communications, evidently. If I had wanted more money than you offered at first, I would have said so. I would have quoted you a price. I did not. I gave you an unqualified refusal. I give it to you still. No. Flatly, absolutely, and finally, no." Nguma was the only one of the three who could find his tongue immediately. "'I should think,' he said somewhat acidly, "'that you would consider it your duty to—' The detective cut him off. The detective cut him off. My duty, Mr. Nguma, is, at this moment, to my employers. I am a paid investigator for Lloyd's of London, Belt Branch. I draw a salary that is more than adequate for my needs and almost adequate for my taste in the little luxuries of life. I am, for the time being at least, satisfied with my work. So are my employers. Until one or the other of us becomes dissatisfied, the situation will remain as it is. I will not accept any outside work of any kind, except at the instructions of, or with the permission of, my employers. I have neither. I want neither at this time. That is all, gentlemen. Good day." "'But the money,' Nguma said. "'The money should be withdrawn from the bank and returned to earth. I suggest you return it to the people who have donated it to your organization. If that is impossible, I suggest you donate it to the government officials who are working so hard to do the job you want done. I assure you, they are much more capable than I of dealing with the Nipe. Good day, Mr. Nguma, Mr. Vandenbosch, Mr. Gerald." They looked hurt, bewildered, and angry. Only Mr. Barnabas Nguma looked as if he might have some slight understanding of what had happened. He was the only one who spoke. Good day, Mr. Martin. I am sorry we have disturbed you. Thank you for your valuable time," he said with dignity, and then the three men walked out the door, closing it behind them. The detective sat behind his desk, looking at the door, almost as if he could see the men beyond it as they moved down the corridor. Several minutes later, when his secretary opened the door again, he was still staring thoughtfully at it. She thought he was staring at her. "'Something the matter, Mr. Martin?' she said. "'What? Oh, no, no. Nothing, Helen, nothing. Just wool-gathering. Did you see our visitors out all right?' She glided in and closed the door behind her. "'Well, none of them fell and broke a leg, if that's what you mean. But that Mr. Gerald looked as though he might break a blood vessel. I take it you turned them down again?' "'Yes, for the last time, I think. It's a shame they had to travel out here, all that distance, to be turned down. They looked on me as their great white hope. They couldn't really believe I would turn them down. Couldn't let themselves believe it, I guess. They're scared, Helen, bright green scared. I know, but if it weren't for the fact that I have certain pretensions to being a lady, I would have booted that Gerald into orbit without a spacesuit. Oh? He implied, Helen said angrily, that you were a coward, that you were afraid to face the Nipe. The detective chuckled. I hope you didn't say anything. I wanted to, she admitted. I wanted to tell him that guns are easy to buy, that all he had to do was buy one and go after the Nipe himself. I would like to have seen his face if I'd asked him how scared he was of the beast. But I didn't say a word. They weren't talking to me anyway. 
they were talking to each other. I'd almost be willing to bet that Nguma disagreed with Jeral. Nguma didn't think I was a physical coward. He thought I was a moral coward. How'd you know? Intuition, just from the way he talked and acted. He felt the failure more than the others, because he felt there was no hope left at all. He was quite certain that I, myself, did not believe the knife could be caught, by me or anyone else. He thinks that I turned down the job because I know I'd fail, and I don't want to have a failure on my record. Not that big a failure." "'That's ridiculous, of course,' the girl said angrily. The detective noticed a faint note in her voice. She thinks the same as Nguma, he thought, but she doesn't want to admit it to herself. He massaged his closed eyes with the tips of his fingers. Maybe she's right, he thought. Maybe they're both right. Aloud, he said, Well, we've had our little diversion. Let's get back to work. Yes, sir. You want the Benheim file again? Yes. I've got to figure that tricky line down to a T, or we may never see that boy again. We haven't much time either, two weeks at most. She went over to the file cabinet and took out several heavy folders. Imagine, she said, almost to herself, imagine them trying to get you away from here when you have a kidnap case to solve. They must be out of their minds. There was no kidnap case six months ago, the detective thought. She knows that's not the reason. She's only trying to convince herself. Why did I turn them down? His mind veered away from the dangerous subject, and for a moment his mental processes refused to focus on anything at all. The girl put the files down on his desk. Thanks, Helen. Now, let's see. I'll work on this, he thought. I won't even think about the other at all. End of chapter 8 Of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do. Chapter 9. Colonel Walter Mannheim tapped with one thick finger the map that glowed on the wall before him. That's his nest, he said firmly, right there, where those tunnels come together. Bart Stanton looked at the map of Manhattan Island and at the gleaming colored traceries that threaded their various ways across it. Just what was the purpose of all those tunnels? he asked. The majority of them were for rail transportation, said the colonel. The island was hit by a sun bomb during the Holocaust and was almost completely leveled and slagged down. When the city was completely rebuilt afterwards, there was naturally no need for such things so they were simply all sealed off and forgotten. "'He's hiding directly under Government City,' Stanton said. "'Incredible. "'It used to be one of the largest seaports in the world,' Colonel Mannheim said. "'And it very probably still would be if the inertia drive hadn't made air travel cheaper and easier than seagoing. "'How did he find out about those tunnels?' Stanton asked. The colonel pointed at the north end of the island. After the Holocaust, the first returnees to the island were wild animals which crossed over from the mainland to the north. The Harlem River isn't very wide at this point, as you can see. There was a bridge right at about this point here, the very tip of the island. It had collapsed into the water, but there was enough of it to allow animals to cross. Because of the rocky hills at this end of the island, there were places which were spared the direct effects of the bomb, and grasses and trees began growing there. That's why it was decided that section should be left as a game preserve when the government built the capital on the southern part of the island. His finger moved down the map. The upper three miles of the island, down to here, where it begins to widen, are all game preserve. There's a high wall at this point, 
which separates it from the city, which keeps the animals penned in, and the ruins of the bridges which connected with the mainland have been removed, so animals can't get across any more. Two years after he arrived, the knife was almost caught. He had managed to get here from Asia by stealing a flyer in Leningrad. According to Dr. Yoritomo and the other psychologists who have been studying the knife, he apparently does not believe that human beings are anything more than trained animals. He was looking then, as he is apparently still looking, for the real rulers of Earth. He expected to find them, of course, in Government City. Needless to say, said the Colonel with a touch of irony, he failed. But he was seen? asked Stanton. He was seen and pursued. But he got away easily, heading north. The whole island was searched, from the southern tip to the wall, and the police were ready to start an inch-by-inch inch combing of the game preserve by the end of the third day after he was seen. But he hit and robbed a chemical supply house in northern Pennsylvania, killing two men, so the search was called off. It wasn't until two years later, after an exhaustive analysis of the pattern of his raids had given us enough material to work with, that we determined that he must have found an opening into one of the tunnels up here in the game preserve." He gestured again at the map. Very likely, he immediately saw that no human being had been down there in a long time, and that there wasn't much chance of a man coming down there in the foreseeable future. It was a perfect place for his base. "'How does he move in and out?' Stanton asked. "'This way.' The colonel traced a finger down one of the red lines on the map, southward, until he came to a spot only a little over two miles from the southernmost tip of the island. The line turned abruptly toward the western shore of the island, where it stopped. "'There are tunnels that go underneath the Hudson River at this point, and emerge on the other side over here in New Jersey. The one he uses is only one of several, but it has one distinct advantage that the others do not. All of them are flooded now. The sun bomb caved them in when the primary shock wave hit the surface of the water. The tunnel he uses has a hole in it big enough for him to swim through. In spite of his high rate of metabolism, the knipe can store a tremendous amount of oxygen in his body, and can stay under water for as long as half an hour without breathing apparatus, if he conserves his energy. When he's wearing his scuba mask, he's practically a self-contained submarine. The pressure doesn't seem to bother him much. He's a tough cookie." "'I'll remember that,' said Stanton somberly. "'I won't try to race him under water.' "'No,' said Colonel Mannheim. "'No, I wouldn't do that if I were you.' They both knew that there was a great deal more to it than that. In spite of the near miracle that the staff of the Neurophysical Institute had wrought upon Stanton's nerves and muscles and glands, they could only go so far. They could only improve the functioning of the equipment that Stanton already had. They could not add more. His lungs could be, and had been, increased tremendously in efficiency of operation, but the amount of air they could actually hold could only be increased slightly. There was no way to add much extra volume to them without doing so at the expense of other organs. In a breath-holding contest, the knipe would win easily, since his body had evolved organs for oxygen storage, while the human body had not. You cannot make a silk purse out of a sow's ear if you are limited to the structures and compounds found in sow's ears. The best you can do is make a finer, stronger, more sensitive sow's ear. I understand that the knipe has his hideout pretty well bugged with all kinds of alarms, Stanton said. How did you get your own bugs in there without setting off his?" Well, at first we didn't know for sure what he was up to. We weren't even sure he was actually down in those tunnels. But we suspected that if he was, he'd have alarms set all over the place, perhaps even alarms of types we couldn't recognize. But we had to take that chance. We had to watch him. He walked over to the nearby table and opened a box some twelve inches long and five by five inches in cross-section. "'See this?' he said as he took a furry object from the box. It looked like a large rat, dead, stiff, unmoving. 
our spy, said Colonel Mannheim. The rat moved along the rusted steel rail that ran the length of the huge tunnel. To a human being the tunnel would have seemed to be in utter darkness, but the little eyes of the rat saw the surroundings as faintly luminescent, glowing from the infrared radiations given out by the internal warmth of the cement and steel. The main source of the radiations was from above, where the heat of the sun and the warmth from the energy sources in the buildings on the surface seeped through the roof of the tunnel. But here and there were even brighter spots of warmth, spots that moved about on glowing feet and sniffed blindly at the air with tiny glowing noses. Rats. On and on moved the rat, its little pinkish feet pattering almost silently on the oxidized metal surface of the rails. Its sensitive ears picked up the movements and the squeals of other rats, but it paid them no heed. Several times it met other rats on the rail, but most of them sensed the alienness of this rat and scuttled out of its way. Once it met a rat who did not give way. Hungry, perhaps, or perhaps merely yielding to the paranoid fury that was a normal component of the rattish mind, it squealed its defiance to the rat that was not a rat. It advanced, baring its rodent teeth in a yellow daggered snarl of hate. The rat that was not a rat became suddenly motionless. Its sharp little nose pointed directly at the oncoming enemy. There came a noise, a tiny popping hiss, like that of a very small drop of water striking hot metal. From the left nostril of the not-rat, a tiny, glass-like needle snapped out at bullet speed. It struck the advancing rat in the center of the pink tongue that was visible in the open mouth. Then the not-rat scuttled backward faster than any real rat could have moved. For a second the real rat hesitated and it may be that the realization penetrated into its dim brain that rats did not fight this way. Then, as the tiny needle dissolved in its bloodstream, it closed its eyes and collapsed, rolling limply off the rail to the rotted wooden tie beneath. The rat might come to before it was found and devoured by its fellows, or it might not. The not-rat moved on, not caring either way. The human intelligence that looked out from the eyes of the not-rat was only concerned with getting to the nipe. "'That's how we found the nipe,' Colonel Mannheim said. "'And that's how we keep tabs on him now. We have over seven hundred of these remote-control robots hidden in strategic spots throughout those tunnels now, and we can put more in whenever we want. But it took time to get everything set up this way. Now we can follow the nipe wherever he goes so long as he stays in those tunnels. If he went out through the one open-air exit up in the northern part of the island, we could have followed him by bird robots. But, he shrugged wryly, I'm afraid the underwater problem still has us stumped. We can't get the carrier way for the remote control impulses to go very far underwater. How do you get your carrier wave underground to those tunnels? Stanton asked and how do you keep the knife from picking up the radiation?" The colonel grinned widely. One of the boys dreamed up a real cute gimmick. Those old steel rails themselves act as antennas for the broadcaster, and the rat's tail is the pickup antenna. As long as the rat is crawling right on the rail, only a microscopic amount of power is needed for control, not enough for the knife to pick up with his instruments. Each rat carries its own battery for motive power, and there are old copper power cables down there that we can send direct current through to recharge the batteries. And when we need them, the copper cables can be used as antennas. It took us quite a while to work the system out, but it's running smoothly now." Stanton rubbed his head thoughtfully. "'Damn these gaps in my memory,' he thought. It was sometimes embarrassing to ask questions that any schoolboy should know the answer to. Aren't there ways of detecting objects under water? he asked after a moment. Yes, said the colonel, several of them. But they all require beamed energy of some kind to be reflected from the object we want to look at, and we don't dare use anything like that. 
He sat down on one corner of the table, his bright blue eyes looking up at Stanton. "'That's been our big problem all along,' he said seriously. "'We have to keep the knight from knowing he's being watched. In the tunnels themselves, we've only used equipment that was already there, adding only what we absolutely had to, small things. A few strands of wire, a tiny relay, things that can be hidden in out-of-the-way places, and can be made to look as though they were a part of the original old equipment. After all, he has his own alarm system in that maze of tunnels, and we have deliberately kept away from his detecting devices. He knows about the rats and ignores them. They're part of the environment. But we don't dare use anything that would tip him off to our knowledge of his whereabouts. One slip like that, and hundreds of human beings will have died in vain." "'And if he stays down there too long,' Stanton said levelly, "'millions more may die.' The Colonel's face was grim as he looked directly into Stanton's eyes. "'That's why you have to know your job down to the most minute detail when the time comes to act. The whole success of the plan will depend on you and you alone.' Stanton's eyes didn't avoid the colonel's. That's not true, he thought. I'll be only one man on a team, and you know that, Colonel Mannheim, but you'd like to shove all the responsibility off onto someone else, someone stronger. You've finally met someone that you consider your superior in that way, and you want to unload. I wish I felt as confident as you do, but I don't. Aloud, he said, Sure, nothing to it. All I have to do is take into account everything that's known about the Nipe and make allowances for everything that's not known." Then he smiled. Not, he added, that I can think of any other way to go about it. Third Interlude Mrs. Frobisher touched the control button that depolarized the window in the breakfast room, letting the morning sun stream in through the now transparent sheet of glass. Her attention was caught by something across the street, and she said in a low voice, "'Larry, come here.' Larry Frobisher looked up from his morning coffee. "'What is it, hon?' "'The Stanton boys. Come look.' Frobisher sighed. "'Who are the Stanton boys, and why should I come look?' But he got up and came over to the window. "'See, over there on the walkway toward the play area,' his wife said. I see a boy pushing a wheeled contraption and three girls playing with a skip-rope," Frobisher said. Or do you mean that the Stanford boys are dressed up as girls? Stanton, she corrected him, they just moved into the apartment on the first floor. Who, the three girls? No, silly, the two Stanton boys and their mother. One of them is in that wheeled contraption. It's called a therapeutic chair. Oh, so the poor kid's been hurt. What's so interesting about that, aside from morbid curiosity?" The boy pushing the chair went around a bend in the walkway out of sight, and Frobisher went back to his coffee while his wife spoke. "'Their names are Mart and Bart,' she said. They're twins.' "'I should think,' Frobisher said, applying himself to his breakfast, "'that the mother would get a self-powered chair for the boy instead of making the other boy push it. The poor boy can't control the chair, dear," said Mrs. Frobisher, still looking out the window after the vanished twins. There's something wrong with his nervous system. I understand that he was exposed to some kind of radiation when he was only two years old. That's why the chair has to have all those funny instruments built into it. Even his heartbeat has to be controlled electronically. Shame," said Frobisher, spearing a bit of sausage. Kind of rough on both of them, I'd guess. How do you mean, dear? Well, I mean like... Well, for instance, why are they going over to the play area? Play games, right? So the ones that well has got to push his brother over there. Can't just get out and go. Has to take the brother along, too. Kind of a burden, see? Mrs. Frobisher turned away from the window. Why, Larry, I'm surprised at you, really. Don't you think the boy should take care of his brother?" Oh, now, honey, I didn't mean that. It's hard on both of them, 
the kid in the chair has to sit there and watch his brother play baseball or high lie or whatever while he can't do anything himself. Like I say, kind of rough on both of them. Well, yes, I suppose it must be. Want some more coffee? Thanks, honey, and another slice of toast, huh? End of chapter 910. Of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do. Chapter 10. Like some horrendous, watchful gargoyle, the knipe crouched motionlessly on the shadowed roof of the low building. A short projection from the air conditioning intake was wide enough to keep him from being seen from the air and the darkness of the roof prevented anyone on the street from seeing the four violet eyes that kept a careful account of all that went on in the store across the way from his observation post. The lights were still on inside the shop, shedding their glareless brightness through the transparent display windows to fall upon the street outside in large luminous pools. The Nipe knew exactly what each man remaining inside was doing and approximately what each would be doing for the next few minutes, and he watched with the expectation that his prophecies would be fulfilled. He had watched long and made a thorough study of this establishment, and tonight he expected to attain the goal for which he had worked so patiently. This raid was important in two ways. There were pieces of equipment he had to get, and they were in that shop. On the other hand, the raid was, and would be, basically a diversionary tactic. Now that he had located his real target, it was time to create a diversion that would draw his enemy's attention away from his immediate surroundings. This would be a raid that Colonel Walther Mannheim could not ignore. Two men came out the front door. They spoke to someone still inside. "'So long. See you tomorrow.' Then they walked down the street together, conversing in low tones. The Nipe waited. Not until a fifth man stopped after he opened the door and flipped a switch on the inside did the Nipe make any motion. Then he flexed his four pairs of limbs in anticipation, but it wasn't quite time to act yet. The interior lights of the shop went out. Then the man carefully locked the front door, setting the alarms within the shop. Then, serene in the belief that his establishment was thoroughly protected from burglars, he too went down the street. The Nipe waited a few minutes longer before he left his observation post. All was normal, he decided. The time for action had come. The Nipe moved cautiously along the alley toward the rear of the building that was his target. The night watchman had returned to his cubicle, as he always did after his preliminary inspection of the building's alarm system. He would not leave for some time yet, if he followed his habits, and the Nipe saw no reason why he should not. Carefully he approached the rear door of the little optical shop. End of chapter 10 Of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do. Chapter 11 Two massive objects floating in space looked very much like deeply pitted pieces of rock. The larger one, roughly pear shaped and about a quarter of a mile in its greatest dimension, was actually that a huge hunk of rock. The smaller, much smaller, of the two was not what it appeared to be. It was a phony. Anyone who had been able to conduct a very close personal inspection of it would have recognized it for what it was, a camouflaged spaceboat. The camouflaged spaceboat was on a near collision course with reference to the larger mass, although their relative velocities were not great. At precisely the right time, the smaller drifted by the larger only a few hundred yards away. The weakness of the gravitational fields generated between the two caused only a slight change of orbit on the part of both bodies. Then they began to separate. 
but during the few seconds of their closest approach, a third body detached itself from the camouflaged spaceboat and shot rapidly across the intervening distance to land on the surface of the floating mountain. The third body was a man in a spacesuit. As soon as he landed, he sat down, stock still, and checked the instrument case he held in his hands. No response. Thus far, then, he had succeeded. He had had to pick his time precisely. The people who were already on this small planetoid could not use their detection equipment while the planetoid itself was within detection range of Beacon 971, only two hundred and eighty miles away. Not if they wanted to keep from being found. Radar pulses emanating from a presumably lifeless planetoid would be a dead giveaway. Other than that, they were mathematically safe. Mathematically safe they would be if, and only if, they depended upon the laws of chance. No ship moving through the asteroid belt would dare to move at any decent velocity without using radar, so the people on this particular lump of planetary flotsam would be able to spot a ship's approach easily, long before their own weak detection system would register on the pickups of an approaching ship. The power and range needed by a given detector depends on the relative velocity. The greater that velocity becomes, the more power, the greater range needed. At one mile per second, a ship needs a range of only thirty miles to spot an obstacle thirty seconds away. At ten miles per second, it needs a range of three hundred miles. The man who called himself Stanley Martin had carefully plotted the orbit of this particular planetoid and had let his spaceboat coast in without using any detection equipment except the visual. It had been necessary, but very risky. The asteroid belt, that magnificently useful collection of stone and metal lumps revolving about the sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, is somewhat like the old-fashioned merry-go-round. If every orbit in the belt were perfectly circular, the analogy would be more exact. If they were, then every rock in the belt would follow every other in almost exactly the way every merry-go-round horse follows every other. The gravitational attraction between the various bodies in the belt can be neglected. It is much less, on the average, than the gravitational pull between any two horses on a carousel. If every orbit of those millions upon millions of pieces of rock and metal were precisely circular, then they would constitute the grandest, biggest merry-go-round in the universe. But those orbits are not circular, and even if they were, they would not remain so long. The great mass of Jupiter would soon pull them out of such perfect orbits and force them to travel about the sun in elliptical paths, and therein lies the trouble. If their paths were exactly circular, then no two of that vast number of planetoids would ever collide. They would march about the sun in precise order, like the soldiers in a military parade, except that they would retain their spacing much longer than any group of soldiers could possibly manage to do. But the orbits are elliptical. There is a chance that any two given bodies might collide, although the chance is small. The one compensation is that, if they do collide, they won't strike each other very hard. The detective was not worried about collision. He was worried about observation. Had the people here seen his boat? If so, had they recognized it in spite of the heavy camouflage? And even if they only suspected, what would be their reaction? He waited. It takes nerve and patience to wait for thirteen solid hours without making any motion other than an occasional flexing of muscles. But he managed that long before the instrument case that he held waggled a meter needle at him. The one tension-relieving factor was the low gravity. The problem of sleeping on a bed of nails is caused by the likelihood of the sleeper accidentally throwing himself off the bed. The probability of puncture or discomfort from the points is almost negligible. When the needle on the instrument panel flickered, he got to his feet and began moving. He was almost certain that he had not been detected. Walking was out of the question. This was a silicate alumina rock, not a nickel-iron one. 
The group of people that occupied it had deliberately chosen it that way, so that there would be no chance of its being picked out for slicing by one of the mining teams in the asteroid belt. Granted, the chance of any given metallic planetoids being selected was very small, but they had not wanted to take even that chance. Therefore, without any magnetic field to hold him down, and with only a very tiny gravitic field, the detective had to use different tactics. It was more like mountain climbing than anything else, except that there was no danger of falling. He crawled over the surface in the same way that an alpine climber might crawl up the side of a steep slope, seeking handholds and toeholds and using them to propel himself onward. The only difference was that he covered distance a great deal more rapidly than a mountain climber could. When he reached the spot he wanted, he carefully concealed himself beneath a craggy overhang. It took a little searching to find exactly the right spot, but when he did, he settled himself into a place in a small pit and began more elaborate preparations. Self-hypnosis required nearly ten minutes. The first five or six minutes were taken up in relaxing from his exertions. Gravity notwithstanding, he had to push his hundred and eighty pounds over a considerable distance. When he was completely relaxed and completely hypnotized, he reached up and cut down the valve that fed oxygen into his suit. Then, of his own will, he went cataleptic. A single note, sounded by the instruments in the case at his side, woke him instantly. He came fully awake, as he had commanded himself to do. Immediately he turned up his oxygen intake, at the same time glancing at the clock dial in his helmet. He smiled. Nineteen days and seven hours. He had calculated it almost precisely. He wasn't more than an hour off, which was really pretty good, all things considered. He consulted his instruments again. The supply ship was ten minutes away. The smile stayed on his face as he prepared for further action. The first two minutes were conscientiously spent in inhaling oxygen. Even under the best cataleptic conditions, the human body tended to slow down too much. He had to get himself prepared for violent movement. Eight minutes left. He climbed out of the little grotto where he had concealed himself and moved toward the spot where he knew the airlock to the caverns underneath the planetoid surface was hidden. Then again he concealed himself and waited, while he continued to breathe deeply of the highly oxygenated air in his suit. Five minutes before the ship landed, he swallowed eight ounces of the nutrient solution from the tank in the back of his helmet. The solution of amino acids, vitamins, and honey sugar also contained a small amount of stimulant of the dexedrine type and one percent ethanol. He waited for another minute for the solution to take effect, then he unholstered his gun. The supply ship wasn't a big one. He had known it wouldn't be. It was only a little larger than the one he had used to come out here. It dropped down to the surface of the small planetoid only ten meters from the hidden trapdoor that led to the airlock beneath the surface. Suddenly he could hear voices in the earphones of his helmet. Lasser? Yeah, it's me, Fritz. I got all the supplies and a nice package of good news. The airlock trapdoor opened and a space-suited figure came out. How about the deal? That's the good news said the second suited figure as it came from the airlock of the grounded spaceboat. Another five million! The detective, hidden behind the nearby crag of rock, listened and watched for a minute or so while the two men began unloading cases of foodstuffs from the spaceboat. Then, satisfied that it was perfectly safe, he aimed his gun and shot twice in rapid succession. The range was almost point-blank and there was, of course, no need to take either gravity or air resistance into account. The pellets of the shotgun-like charge that blasted out from the gun were small, needle-shaped, and massive. They were oriented point-forward by the magnetic field along the barrel of the weapon. Of the hundreds of charges fired, only a few penetrated the spacesuits of the targets, 
but those few were enough. The powerful drug in the needle-pointed head of each tiny crystal went directly into the bloodstream of each target. Each man felt an itching sensation. He had less than two seconds to think about it before unconsciousness overtook him and he slumped nervelessly. Gun in hand, the detective ran across the intervening space quickly, his body only a few degrees from the horizontal, and his toes paddling rapidly to propel him over the rough rock. He braked himself to a halt and slapped air patches over the areas where his charges had struck the men's suits, sealing the tiny air leaks, and at the same time driving more of the tiny needles into their skins. They would be out for a long time. Neither of them had yet fallen to the ground. That would take several minutes under this low gravity. He left them to drop and headed toward the open airlock. This was what he had been waiting for all these nineteen days in cataleptic hypnosis. He couldn't have cut his way into the hideout from the outside. He had had to wait until it was opened, and that time had come only with the supply ship. Once in the airlock, he touched the control stud that would close the outer door, pump air into the waiting room, and open the inner door. Here was his greatest point of danger, greater even than the danger of coming to the planetoid itself, or the danger of waiting nineteen days in a cataleptic trance for the coming of the supply ship. If the ones who remained within suspected anything, anything at all, then his chances of coming out of this alive were practically nil but there was no reason why they should suspect. They should think that the man coming in was one of their own. The radio contact between the men outside had been limited to a few micro-milliwatts of power, necessarily, since radio waves of very small wattage can be decoded at tremendous distances in open space. The men inside the planetoid certainly should not have been able to pick up any more than the beginning of the early conversation, before it had been cut completely off by the intervening layers of solid rock. The chamber he entered was a high-speed airlock. Unlike the soundless discharge of his special gun in the outer airlessness, the blast of air that came into the waiting chamber was like a hurricane in noise and force the room filled with air in a very few seconds. The detective held on to the handholds tightly, while the brief but violent winds buffeted him. He turned as the inner door opened. His eyes took in the picture in a fraction of a second. In an even smaller fraction his mind assimilated the picture. The woman was dark-haired, dark-eyed, and muscular. Her mouth was wide and thick-lipped beneath a large nose. The man was leaner and lighter, bony-faced and beady-eyed. The woman said, "'Fritz? What?' And then he shot them both with gun number two. No needle charges this time. Such shots would have blown them both in two, unprotected as they were by spacesuits. The small handgun merely jangled their nerves with a high-powered blast of accurately beamed supersonics. While they were still twitching, he went over and jabbed them with a drug needle. Then he went on into the hideout. He had to knock out one more man, whom he found asleep in a small room off the short corridor. It took a gas bomb to get the two women who were guarding the kid. He made sure that the Ben Heim boy was all right. Then he went to the little communications room and called for help. End of chapter 11《Of Anything You Can Do》by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anything You Can Do, Chapter 12. St. Louis hadn't been hit during the Holocaust. It still retained much of the old-fashioned flavor of the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, especially in the residential districts. The old homes, some of them dating clear back to the time of Sam Clemens and the paddle-wheel steamboat, still stood, warm and well-preserved. 
Bart Stanton liked to walk along these quiet streets of an evening just to let the placid peacefulness seep into him. And, knowing it was rather childish, he still enjoyed the small Huckleberry Finn pleasure of playing hooky from the Neurophysical Institute. Technically, he supposed, he was still a patient there, more now that he had completely accepted Colonel Walther Mannheim's assignment. He was presumably under military discipline. He assumed that, if he had asked permission to leave the Institute's grounds, he would have been given that permission without question. But, like playing hooky or stealing watermelon, it was more fun if it was done on the sly. The boy who comes home feeling deliciously wicked and delightfully sinful after staying away from school all day can have his whole day ruined completely by being told that it was a holiday and the school had been closed. Bart Stanton didn't want to spoil his own fun by asking for permission to leave the grounds, when it was so easy for a man with his special abilities to get out without asking. Besides, there was a chance, a small one, he thought, that permission might be refused for one reason or another, and Stanton was fully aware that he would not disobey a direct request, to say nothing of a direct order, that he stay within the walls of the Institute. He didn't want to run any risk of losing his freedom, small though it was. After five years of mental and physical hell, he felt a need to get out into the world of normal, ordinary, everyday people. His legs moved smoothly, surely, and unhurriedly, carrying him aimlessly along the resilient walkway, under the warm glow of the streetlights. The people around him walked as casually, and with seemingly as little purpose as he did. There was none of the brisk sense of urgency that he felt inside the walls of the Institute. But he knew he could never get away from that sense of urgency completely, even out here. There were times when it seemed that all he had ever done, all his whole life, was to train himself for the one single purpose of besting the Nipe. If he wasn't training physically, he was listening to lectures from Dr. George Yoritomo, or from Colonel Mannheim. If he wasn't working his muscles, he was laying plans and considering possibilities for the one great goal that seemed to be the focal point of his whole life. What would happen if he failed? What would happen if he, the great, hyped-up Superman, found that the Nipe had only been working at half his normal potential? What would happen if that alien horror simply slashed out with one ultra-fast hand and showed Colonel Mannheim and all his watching technicians that they had completely underestimated his alien ability? What would happen? Why, Bart Stanton would die, of course, just as hundreds of other human beings had died in the past ten years. Stanton would become another statistic. And then Mannheim's Plan Beta would go into effect the Nipe would be killed eventually. But what if he, Stanton, won? Then what? The people around him were not part of his world, really. Their thoughts, their motions, their reactions were slow and clumsy in comparison with his own. Once the Nipe had been conquered, what purpose would there be in the life of Bartholomew Stanton? He was surrounded by people, but he was not one of them. The people around him were not a part of his world, really. Their thoughts, their motions, their reactions were slow and clumsy in comparison with his own. Once the Nipe had been conquered, what purpose would there be in the life of Bartholomew Stanton? He was surrounded by people, but he was not one of them. He was immersed in a society that was not his own because it was not, could not, be geared to his abilities and potentials. But there was no other society to turn to either. He was not a man, alone, afraid, in a world he had never made. He was a man who had been made for a world, a society, that did not exist. Women, a wife, a family life? Where? With whom? He pushed the thoughts from his mind, the questions unanswered and perhaps unanswerable. In spite of the apparent bleakness of the future, he had no desire to die. 
and there was, psychologically, the possibility that too much brooding of that kind would evoke a subconscious reaction that could slow him down or cause a wrong decision at a vital moment. A feeling of futility could operate to bring on his death in spite of his conscious determination to win the coming battle with the Nipe. The Nipe was his first duty. When that job was finished, he would consider the problem of himself. Just because he could not now see the answer to that problem did not mean that no answer existed. He suddenly realized that he was hungry. He had been walking through Memorial Park, past the museum, an old worn edifice that was still called the Missouri Pacific Building. There was a small restaurant only a block away. He reached into his pocket and took out the few coins that were there. Not much, but enough to buy a sandwich and a glass of milk. Because of the trust fund that had been set up when he had started the treatment at the Neurophysical Institute, he was already well off, but he didn't have much cash. What good was cash at the Institute, where everything was provided? He stopped at a news vendor, dropped in a coin, and waited for the reproducing mechanism to turn out a fresh paper. Then he took the folded sheets and went on to the restaurant. He rarely read a news sheet. Mostly, his information about the world that existed outside the walls of the Institute came from the televised newscasts, but occasionally he liked to read the small, relatively unimportant little stories about people who had done small, relatively unimportant things, stories that didn't appear in the headlines or the newscasts. The last important news story that he had heard had come two nights before. The Nipe had robbed an optical products company in Miami. The camera had shown the shop on the screen. Whatever had been used to blow open the vault had been more effective than necessary. It had taken the whole front door of the shop and both windows, too. The bent and twisted paraglass that had lain on the pavement showed how much force had been applied from within. And yet the results had not been those of an explosion. It was more as though some tremendous force had pushed outward from within. It had not been the shattering shock of high explosive, but some great thrust that had unhurriedly but irresistibly moved everything out of its way. Nothing had been moved very far, as it would have been by a blast. It appeared that everything had simply fallen aside, as though scattered by a giant hand. The main braces of the storefront were still there, bent outward a little, but not broken. The vault door had been slammed to the floor of the shop, only a few feet from the front door. The vault itself had been farther back, and the camera had showed it standing wide open, gaping. Inside there had been pieces of fragile glass standing on the shelves, unmoved, unharmed. The force, whatever it had been, had moved in one direction only, from a point within the vault, just a few feet from the door, pushing outward to tear out the heavy door as though it had been made of paraffin or modeling clay. Stanton had recognized the vault construction type, the Voisier construction, which, by test, could withstand almost everything known, outside of the actual application of atomic energy itself. In a widely publicized demonstration several years before, a Voisier vault had been cut open by a team of well-trained, well-equipped technicians. It had taken twenty-one hours for them to breach the wall, and they had had no fear of interruption or of making a noise, or of setting off the intricate alarms that were built into the safe itself. Not even a Borazon drill could make much of an impression on a metal which had been formed under millions of atmospheres of pressure. And yet the Nipe had taken that door out in a second without much effort at all. The crowd that had gathered at the scene of the crime had not been large. The very thought of the Nipe kept people away from places where he was known to have been. The specter of the Nipe evoked a fear, a primitive fear, fear of the dark and fear of the unknown, combined with the rational fear of a very real, very tangible danger. And yet there had been a crowd of onlookers. In spite of their fear, it is hard to keep human beings from being curious. 
It was known that the knipe didn't stay around after he had struck. And besides, the area was now full of armed men. So the curious came to look and to stare in revulsion at the neat pile of gnawed and bloody bones that had been the night watchman, carefully killed and eaten by the knipe before he had opened the vault. Thus curiosity does make fools of us all, and the native hue of caution is crimson o'er by the bright red of morbid fascination. Stanton went through the door of the automatic restaurant and walked over to the vending wall. The big dining room was only about three quarters full of people, and there were plenty of seats available. He fed coins into the proper slots, took his sandwich and milk over to a seat in one corner, and made himself comfortable. He flipped open the newspaper and looked at the front page. And for a moment his brain seemed to freeze. The story itself was straightforward enough. Benheim kidnappers nabbed. Stan Martin does it again. Series, June 3, Interplanetary News Service. The three men and three women who allegedly kidnapped ten-year-old Shmuel Benheim were brought to justice today through the single-handed efforts of Stanley Martin, famed investigator for Lloyds of London. The boy, held prisoner for more than ten weeks on a small planetoid, was reportedly in good health. According to Lieutenant John Vale of the Planetoid Police, the kidnap gang could not have been taken by direct assault on their hideout, because of fear that the boy might be killed. The operation required a carefully planned one-man infiltration of their hideout, Lieutenant Vale said. Mr. Martin was the man for the job. Labeled the most outrageous kidnapping in history, the affair was conceived as a long-term method of gaining control of Heavy Metals Incorporated, controlled by Moshe ben Chaim, the boy's father. The details, but Bart Stanton wasn't interested in the details. After only a glance through the first part of the article, his eyes returned to the picture that had caught his attention. The line of print beneath it identified the picture as being that of a man named Stanley Martin. But a voice in Bart Stanton's brain said, Not Stan Martin. The name is Mart Stanton. And Bartholomew felt a roar of confusion in his mind, because he didn't know who Mart Stanton was, and because the face in the picture was his own. End of chapter 12